Satan Baby, a spooky yarn for Yuletide, told by Sir Desmond Sterling. Chapter 3 Yes, Dr. Cunnilinga, Charles's old nemesis, the evil necromage and Satanist from darkest Burma. Many of the battles they had fought with each other, and each time Charles had won. But always the wily sorcerer had escaped justice, despite seemingly dying in all sorts of ghastly but self-inflicted ways. Charles swallowed his surprise and affected a nonchalance he didn't feel inside. So... Canilinga, you managed to escape Mucky Ho. Canilinga smiled, although only with his tooth-crammed mouth. His shark-like eyes, encased behind bottle-thick glasses, stayed as dead as ever. Mucky Ho, a place of great archaeological importance just outside Swindon, was the scene of Charles's last encounter with the little diabolist. Canilinga had attempted to open the very gateway to hell itself with the help of a dozen unfrocked nuns, a fiery bonfire of pure opium and the usual goats. Charles had defeated him using only his pure heart and a fireman's hose. The last sight of Canilinga had been when he fell into a fiery chasm, screaming at the top of his cowardly lungs as he plummeted towards the eternal torment of Hades. How did you escape hell, Canilinga? asked Charles casually. Canilinga shrugged. Oh, you know. So what dastardly deed are you up to now? Canilinga giggled girlishly, a sound which never failed to turn Charles's stomach. I thought you'd never ask, my dear Viscount. Canilinga chucked the sleeping baby down on a bale of hay. As you know, we Satanists like to subvert the rituals of hated Christianity. At Christmas, Canilinga struggled to say the word, there are ample opportunities. And where does Lady Selina fit into your vile plans? shouted Simon. Very simple, said Canilinga. She is a virgin. So in an elegant parody of the Nativity, I will... At the chimes of midnight, insert a baby inside her. There was silence. What? asked Charles. I said, started Cunnilinger impatiently. I heard what you said, you vile toad of a man, snapped Charles. I just didn't believe it. Even by your low standards, this infernal scheme scrapes the depths. Uncle, whispered Simon, how is he going to get a baby that big up Lady Selina's bottom? Everyone stared at Simon. Does the idiot boy really not know? asked Canilinga. Simon, Charles began to say. His nephew looked at him. Anguish and bewilderment etched in those divine eyes. Charles thought better of it. I'll explain later. While this exchange had been occurring, Staunchpole had been sidling ever closer to Canilinga. Charles watched him out of the corner of his eye while keeping his gaze fixed firmly on the tubby sorcerer. Charles didn't know what Staunchpole was planning. Snatching the baby? or sweeping up Lady Selina, or clobbering the wicked little magician. But just as Staunchpole was about to leap, Cunnilinga snapped his fingers, and the donkey bared its teeth and leapt for the manservant's throat. Staunchpole's reactions were still top-notch despite his war mood, and he punched the donkey in the jaw. It hee-hawed in fury, and the pair of them, man and beast, disappeared in a flurry of bites and kicks and half-Nelsons. Everyone else ignored them. Canilinga picked up the baby. Charles thought quickly. Uh, surely, he asked, to complete the picture you need a Herod, or rather an anti-Herod. 
Ganilinga giggled. You are such a worthy adversary, Viscount Charles. Yes, an anti-Herod. Someone who wants to protect the child rather than slaughter it. For that, we need someone maternal and nurturing and caring. And with that, something fell down the chimney in a cloud of dust and hay and centuries-old soot. It was Marjorie. She lay in the earth, dazed, but still clutching her half-full glass, Charles noted, grudgingly impressed. She took a large swig, stood up, and approached the abominable nativity scene. Surely Canny Linga didn't be. Marjorie peered myopically around. She sized up Canny Linga, dismissed him as alimony material, snickered at the prostate Lady Selina, and then her eyes landed on the baby. She grimaced. Oh, where did that come from? she sneered. I can't abide babies. Not one of your dozens of bastards, is it, Charles? Ganny Linga's petulant face fell. But, but, but... Charles laughed and clapped his hands. Well done, Ganny Linga. You found a woman so maternal that if there wasn't an ashtray available, she would use the nearest baby's mouth. Ganny Linga's expression contorted as his brain whirled through many combinations of new ideas. Charles tensed. If he was going to act, then now was the time. But what first? The baby? Lady Selina? Marjorie could take care of herself. He glanced at Simon, hoping his nephew would react at the same time. But the darling boy was watching Staunchpole and the donkey, who were now kickboxing each other from one bale of hay to another. Right, Charles decided. Baby first. It was probably just a local child, but there was just a chance it could be of his own class. Nannies were always mislaying their charges, he had found, especially at this time of year, when the sherry was flowing rather too generously in the staff's direction. Charles was about to spring into action when a new noise filled the air. It was a rhythmic clanking, as though metal objects were being bashed together. It got rapidly louder, until even Cunnilingus awoke from his reverie and looked around. An expression of horror spread across his usually sphinx-like face. To be concluded. Sir Desmond Sterling's Satan Baby was written and performed by Anthony Keach.